Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Um, any questions? No questions. Uh, so, today I'd like to continue uh, our discussion on magnetic materials. And uh, the fundamental question really in this discussion is why the magnetic flux density uh, in relation with the magnetic field intensity in free space is given by this relation. Mu naught is the magnetic permeability in uh, vacuum for pi times 10 to minus 7 Henry per meter. Uh, whereas inside uh, natural media, this is modified by the relative magnetic permeability, mu sub r. So this product is the magnetic permeability of the medium Uh, we call it mu, and uh, mu sub r is the relative magnetic permeability. Just like we saw in electrostatics that we had, the dielectric permittivity of vacuum, epsilon naught, 10 to minus 9 by 36 pi farad per meter, and we had the relative dielectric permittivity epsilon sub r, and the product epsilon naught, epsilon r, uh, was giving us the dielectric permittivity. So where does this come from? Uh, as we've said, and I'd like to uh, review uh, these two fundamental concepts behind the interaction between magnetic fields and natural media. There is just two of them. So the fundamental concepts are first of all that uh, Inside natural media, the orbital and the spin motion of electrons So you remember the uh, very simple uh, classical model of uh, uh, the atom with the nucleus and the uh, orbiting electrons. Uh, electrons can be in orbital motion. They have also a self-spin uh, motion. So all these motions can be actually modeled as magnetic dipoles. So the orbital and spin motion of electrons inside natural media can be modeled or can be viewed as magnetic dipoles. And this is really reminiscent of what happens in uh, electricity, in electrostatics, where if you put a natural medium inside an electric field, then the positive charges uh, will be attracted to the negative uh, side of the electric field and the uh, negative charges to the positive side. For example, if we have a dielectric inside a capacitor, and then the molecules will start forming electric dipoles. Electric dipole is a system of two charges, positive and negative, at a distance uh, from each other. So uh, we see then a natural medium macroscopically as a volume where magnetic dipoles exist and they are generally randomly oriented. And these are the magnetic dipole moments that result from these motions. Okay, so that's how it looks like. The second concept now is that those dipoles first of all, they produce their own magnetic field. So they are producing their own magnetic flux lines. We uh, had seen them actually ourselves. They would look, for example, for this uh, dipole, they would look like this. For this dipole, they would look like this. So they are producing themselves some flux. So the first uh, point to be made about these magnetic dipoles is that they produce their own flux. And the second, they would tend to align with external magnetic fields. And that's where the interaction happens. That is, if you bring in a magnetic field, 
then that magnetic field will apply a torque on these dipoles. And I'd like to make this distinction, and I will make this distinction clear between the internal magnetic field and the external magnetic field. So here we're talking about the internal magnetic field, but if you brought in a, a magnet, for example, an external magnetic field, those dipoles would tend to align. Why? Because there is a torque. Uh, that torque, we calculated it. It was one of the first things that we saw uh, in magnetism. For a magnetic dipole of magnetic dipole M, of magnetic dipole moment M, an external magnetic flux density B, they will receive a torque M cross B. And you see that this torque is zero in two cases, either when the uh, magnetic dipole moment is parallel to the external field, or when the magnetic dipole moment is anti-parallel to the external field. You see the M cross B is zero when the two vectors are either at zero degrees or 180 degrees. So in both cases, um, we get zero torque. So these are the two fundamental principles. So now let's see how these principles play out and give rise to this distinction between magnetic flux density and magnetic field intensity. So let's start from uh, a solenoid like the one that we solved in the previous lecture. So a solenoid is uh, basically a system where you take a wire and you turn it and let's say it looks like this. Okay, so this is the solenoid. The current turns around like that. Let's say that we have n turns per unit length. And if we do have n turns per unit length, and the current here is I, and if uh, the axis of the solenoid here is the Z axis, we saw that in this solenoid, uh, there will be a magnetic flux that will be almost uniform away from the edges. So the magnetic flux lines, we calculated them in the previous lecture, and we find that B of the solenoid, uh, in fact, let me just start from H, the magnetic field intensity of the solenoid is N times I in the Z direction, away from the edges. Uh, we showed this from Ampere's law on Monday. That means that now that I have here pure wire, therefore the magnetic field lines here are in free space, the associated magnetic flux density will be mu naught times this. So mu naught times n times i z hat. Because now I have the solenoid, I have this magnetic field in free space, as you see. So these magnetic flux lines are in free space. Independently, I take a cylinder made of a natural medium, let's say iron, some metal, or maybe plastic. So a cylinder, uh, solid cylinder, medium. Uh, you may be thinking of this as the, what we call the core of, the of an electromagnet, because this is really the, um, 
most basic form, most fundamental form of an electromagnet. An electromagnet means that you produce a magnetic field just by electric current, that you don't bring in any magnets um, from, that you extracted from a rock and you use them to produce a magnetic field. You just do electromagnet means that you just take a wire, you fit it with a current, and you get the magnetic field out of that. You don't need to take a rock, uh, a piece of a rock, with magnetic properties to get your magnetic field. So this solenoid is the basic form of an electromagnet. Now consider a cylinder that is made of a natural medium, and that can be iron, that can be um, plastic, wood, whatever. Just a cylinder, okay, like this. So this cylinder inside has those magnetic dipoles, and uh, those magnetic dipoles uh, Generally, in most media, they have random orientations. That's why if I have uh, uh, some metallic uh, object, uh, staple, or uh, the chalk holder, it won't be attracted to the wood. Because uh, those uh, random orientations of the magnetic dipoles inside the medium basically mean that if you add up the fluxes that each one produces, will adapt to zero. And that's why we don't have much of magnetic phenomena associated with walls, with the board, with plastic, with even our bodies. We don't interact much with, uh, uh, with uh, magnets in a way that magnets interact with other objects. So now we have those two things, the solenoid and the cylinder. Okay. So now I will put the, solenoid, the cylinder inside the solenoid. Uh, that is uh, the next uh, step in this thought experiment. And uh, you may recall a similar experiment that we did in electrostatics where we put in a dielectric inside the capacitor. So, So now what happens, uh, we have uh, the cylinder, like this, and we have the solenoid that wraps around the cylinder, So now what happens? Any guesses? Yes. Right. Magnetization is the uh, formal term. What this actually means is that now this external magnetic field will produce a torque on these dipole moments and then as a result those dipole moments will, t will tend to align or misalign with the external magnetic field. So then what we have is basically an alignment or misalignment but let's say this alignment of the magnetic dipole moments. I, the way that I uh, drew it is a total misalignment. Let me just uh, do it the other way, like this. So you see now, the magnetic dipole moments tend to align due to the torque with the magnetic field. And now I have something that I didn't have before. That is, the magnetic dipole moments inside, the magnetic fluxes that are produced by the magnetic dipole moments, 
do not cancel out anymore. They are actually adding up. And hence, I have a measurable impact on the total magnetic flux. So the magnetic dipole moments align, produce additional flux. So now I will have the magnetic flux here You see the magnetic field intensity, and that is the distinction between magnetic field intensity and magnetic flux density. The magnetic field intensity, you see, does not change. Does not change because it depends on the current. So the electromagnet is really the structure that shows you what's the difference between the magnetic field intensity and magnetic flux density. Here, I'm bringing in the current. The magnetic field intensity depends on the current that I'm enforcing. And, uh, and therefore, now that I inserted the material, the current is the same because I'm holding the source. I'm controlling the current. And therefore, it remains n times i. Number of uh, turns per unit length times the current does not change. But the flux now has changed because in addition to what I had before, I have this additional flux due to the magnetic dipoles. What caused the alignment of the magnetic dipoles? The magnetic field. So the magnetic field, this H, was actually the origin of this alignment that produced this measurable flux from the magnetic dipoles. So we have a relation between the cause and the effect that for reasonably small magnetic fields, field intensities, will remain almost linear. And uh, this additional flux is equal to mu naught, we use the same constant here, and then the effect, the cause, so this is the effect, which is the flux. This is the cause, which is the magnetic field. This is the constant that I would have in free space. And now, in addition to that constant, I have another parameter that describes how the medium behaves, and it's characteristic of the medium, because as, I, as you see here from the relation between the torque and, the, uh, and M, you may have alignment or misalignment. So this magnetic flux may actually reinforce the external magnetic flux or counteract the magnetic flux. And as well, we have here a very complex effect, and we're trying to water down this uh, description in order to keep only what is necessary for us to understand engineering applications like uh, electric machines, electromagnets, uh, chargers, like the chargers that we're using in your cell phones, and so on. Uh, so in, um, in uh, general, with this alignment and misalignment, we will have also an effect of the crystal, because the dipoles try to align, they also, uh, they also exert forces onto each other. So the alignment may not be perfect in some materials, may be perfect in other materials. So that all depends on the material, on the crystal structure and so on. All this is absorbed by a constant that we call magnetic susceptibility of the medium. That is, how susceptible is the medium to this external magnetic field that tries to align the um, that tries to align the magnetic dipoles. Okay? So as a result, and to go back to the original question here,
in natural media, the magnetic flux is the sum of these two terms, the magnetic flux in free space, that would exist in free space, plus the magnetic flux due to magnetic dipoles so uh, fairly uh, simple relation and now if you take mu naught out as a common factor uh, this one plus susceptibility is what we call the relative magnetic permeability. So this is the answer to the question. You have this response of the medium to the external field. That response will create uh, some net magnetic flux because now the magnetic dipoles are not misaligned and therefore cancelling each other's flux. They can now produce measurable effect on the total flux inside the medium and that is represented by this mu sub r the relative magnetic permeability. Okay. So very uh, simple outcome of uh, this complicated effect, which involves also quantum effects. But uh, as I said, we try to limit all this discussion to what is necessary for us to understand some basic applications. Uh, just to uh, close it out, since your classmate mentioned the term magnetization, so magnetization is all this effect, but also it has a formal meaning, and precisely this term here is called the magnetization vector. So uh, let me just define it. It's just an additional definition that magnetization M is chi sub M times magnetic field intensity. So hopefully this helps clarify the difference between magnetic field intensity and magnetic flux density. For example, when you buy a bar magnet, when you buy a bar magnet from the store, that has magnetic flux. It has permanent magnetic flux. But you don't wrap any current around it. So the magnetic field intensity is actually there zero. So zero magnetic field intensity, but you have the magnetic flux density that comes from the uh, alignment of the dipoles. So now, uh, before I move on, let me just give you a, um, an overview of, uh, okay, out of all these things, what do we observe in natural media? Uh, because there is a wide range of effects. Let's see, I'm trying to send the projector. I guess it will turn on. So until the projector uh, comes on, any questions? Okay, so the projector is here. Okay. So we have uh, basically these three main categories of magnetic responses that we are observing. Uh, diamagnetism, so in uh, diamagnetism, the chi uh, sub m, this magnetic susceptibility, is actually negative, close to zero, but negative. And uh, 
So you see here, typical value of x sub, of chi sub m, magnetic susceptibility, minus 10 to minus 5. So as a result, the uh, relative magnetic permeability is smaller than 1. So in that case, we have actually misalignment of the magnetic dipoles, not very strong, and as a result, the mu sub r is slightly less than 1. So we have uh, uh, mu sub bars in the order of uh, point, uh, let's say, for bismuth. See, for bismuth, uh, mu sub bar is 0 0.99998333. So it behaves more or less like vacuum, but a little bit less than vacuum, just a little bit. Okay? So bismuth, copper, diamond, gold, lead, mercury, silver, silicon are common substances. And the primary mechanism of, this dipole mo of um, the dipole moments is actually the orbital uh, motion of electrons. So these dipole moments that we observe in these materials is mainly due to the orbital motion. We have paramagnetic media. media. Uh, so you see none of those two categories qualifies as a magnet because you have really uh, mu sub bars that are close to one. Mu sub bar close to one means that your medium behaves pretty much like vacuum uh, to an external magnetic field. Aluminum, calcium, magnesium, chromium, niobium, platinum, tungsten. So these have, uh, again, chi sub -ems that are almost equal to zero, but a little bit greater than zero. And you see the typical value that is being given here is 10 to minus 5. So we have a mu sub bar that is a little bit greater than 1, a little bit greater than 1. Before I move on, I just wanted to say about the first category, the first category here, that superconductors, media with very high conductivity, tend to exhibit a chi sub m that is actually equal to minus 1. So I should actually add this here because it's one of the things that we will see. Superconductors. exhibit a, a chi sub m that tends to minus 1. We call them perfect diamagnetic media. So it's not just a minus 10 to minus something, but minus 1. What does that mean, that you have minus 1 chi sub m? that magnetic flux is equal to zero. So you get a perfect conductor. Uh, you wrap around, you put it inside an electromagnet, and the perfect conductor has enough magnetic dipole moments inside to exactly cancel out the magnetic flux that is generated by the electromagnet. And hence, the net flux is zero. Does this remind you of anything? Perfect conductors in electric field, what do they do? Electric field, uh, the, uh, a perfect conductor in electric field is an equipotential surface. The electric field lines have to uh, be distorted so that they impinge on the conductor at 90 degrees. and that means that there is here a surface charge density that is negative on this side, positive on this side. That produces a secondary field from positive to negative that cancels exactly the external field in the conductor. And that's why inside the conductor the electric field is zero. So you remember the electric field is zero inside the perfect conductor. And now we see that also the magnetic flux density is zero inside the perfect conductor. It's a perfect diamagnetic medium, and the magnetic uh, flux 
is exactly cancelled out by the dipoles inside the conductor. When there is a lot of conductivity, that means there are a lot of electrons in there. And therefore, uh, there are a lot of electrons to redistribute themselves on the surface to cancel an external electric field. There is a lot of electrons in uh, spin and orbital motions to form magnetic dipoles that are aligned to the uh, magnetic field. And at the end, when they reach equilibrium, they cancel out the magnetic flux density. So all these effects are dual, and a very good way to understand them is to actually try to make this connection between the two. The most interesting media is the magnets. And these are the ferromagnetic media. Uh, so in ferromagnetic media, we have strong magnetic dipole moments. Um, and uh, these media are iron, nickel, cobalt. Uh, so everything that you could consider as a core, as we say, in uh, electric machines and electromagnets, uh, etc. In this case, mu r is actually in the millions. And chi m uh, is also in the millions. So we have here the media that have strong magnetic response. As you see, the, what it says here at the table is that the primary magnetization mechanism is magnetized domains, and also it uh, drops the term hysteresis. So I will explain both of, the, of these now. So in a ferromagnetic medium, the macroscopic picture looks like this. That is, you don't start with randomly oriented magnetic dipole moments all over the place. The medium inside it has regions. And in these regions, the magnetic dipole moments are aligned. So we have uh, uh, such uh, regions where you see inside here, for example, there is all the magnetic dipole moments are already aligned. All the magnetic dipole moments here are already aligned. That's why you see a big green arrow. And uh, these regions are about 100 atoms thick. So you start from this picture. And then once you bring in an external magnetic field, then you start from already a partial alignment of the magnetic dipole moments in the first picture. And then you get strong alignment as a result of the external magnetic field. And that's how the final picture would look like. So then you have already the infrastructure for the alignment of the magnetic dipole moments. You bring in the magnetic field, you complete that alignment. And as a result, you are getting very uh, strong uh, very strong total magnetic flux uh, density out of this media. However, as you know, when you buy a magnet, it doesn't come with a wire. The magnet does not need a current to have the magnetic flux. That means that it has permanent um, magnetic field, permanent magnetic flux. How does this happen? This happens through this uh, hysteresis effect, which I hope I have somewhere here. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So you remember when I said that, uh, magneti that uh, magnetization is chi sub m times h? This looks like a linear relation. So chi sub m may be 1 minus 1.9 or whatever, but seems to be a number. This is not true for ferromagnetic media. So in ferromagnetic media, the relation between the magnetic field intensity and the magnetic flux density is nonlinear. So this is described by a curve like this. And this curve is called a hysteresis curve. And hysteresis is a Greek word for lagging. So let's see what lags here and why it's lagging, and how you read this curve. So you see when you, this is uh, magnetic field intensity, magnetic flux density. So we should basically understand that 
this curve in terms of the th experiment that I, uh, that I showed before. That you have a medium made of, uh, let's say, an iron cylinder, you bring, in, you bring it into an electromagnet, into a solenoid. So in the beginning, the solenoid has current zero. And I am right here. So the total magnetic flux is zero, the magnetic field intensity is zero. Okay, so imagine this uh, same experiment that I ran before. So this is my uh, solenoid and I have now an iron core for this solenoid. So in the beginning, the iron core looks like, uh, looks like this. So there are these domains, but the total magnetic flux is zero. So I don't have external magnetic field. I don't have internal flux. So the magnetic flux is zero. And on this curve, I'm starting from here. Then I turn on the current. And the current now produces an external magnetic field intensity that starts magnetizing the domain. And uh, now I see some flux that is being produced. And for small magnetic field values, B is equal to some number times H. But as I increase the current through the solenoid, so I keep increasing the current through the solenoid, and that means that my magnetic field intensity, which is n times i, increases. So I increase the magnetic field intensity. I trace the curve this way by increasing the current. So the magnetic flux density increases, 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 increases. And then at some point, it reaches saturation, just like in uh, amplifiers. Why do I reach saturation? Because at this point, you see the magnetic flux that I get from these dipoles is exhausted. I basically max out the magnetic flux that can be added to my external flux from these dipoles. And therefore, uh, the medium cannot give me any more. That's all that it can give me. Okay, so now I, I, I have reached this saturation point. So at this point, I am at uh, saturation. Now the hysteresis part, what does it mean? It means now that because this effect involves these regions that are getting aligned and misaligned, and this is a very complicated effect, it's actually not reversible. And when I start now decreasing my current and to go back, I don't go back through the same path. I will go actually back through this path. So this effect is not reversible. That is not a problem, of course. And that is not a problem because when I turn off my current, the magnetic flux density is non-zero. And that's when now my core has become a magnet. So this is called the residual, B sub bar is the residual magnetic flux. Is the residual magnetic flux. And, um, and at this point, you see, I can take out the wire because the current is zero. And my bar now is magnetized. So at this point, A2, I take out the wire. OK? I take out the wire. And I still have what I call a residual magnetic field. That magnetic field will be in exactly the same direction, exactly the same direction as the external magnetic field that produced it. 
because we have here in ferromagnetic media strong alignment between the external magnetic field and the magnetic field of the dipoles. And that's why chi sub m is in the millions, because I have this strong alignment. So at this point, I can take this bar and sell it as a magnet. This is a magnet, and in magnets, the convention is that the North Pole is the one from which the magnetic flux lines externally leave the magnet, and the South Pole is where they re-enter the magnet. So this is the North Pole, and this is the South Pole. Okay. This being said, you see that inside the magnet, because the magnetic flux lines are closed, the direction will be the opposite. So the convention is that the North Pole uh, is the one from which the external part of the magnetic flux lines leaves the magnet, and then the South Pole, where the external part re-enters the magnet. And you see, to complete this curve now, I go and uh, go past this point, how do I go past this point? Any ideas? How do I uh, start getting negative magnetic field intensities? Yeah, go ahead. Reverse the current. Reverse the current. So now I will start to reverse the current. OK, so now instead of going from left to right, it goes from right to left. And I have still the core. So I'm basically trying to demagnetize the core. So now I changed my mind. I don't want to sell it as a magnet anymore, and I want to demagnetize it. So I will reverse the current, and I'll try to go back. And you see, I'm still not on a linear curve because now these dipoles have been magnetized, have been aligned, and I'm trying to misalign them again. So the new current will try to realign the magnetic dipoles on the other side, and I'm reaching this point here. And at this point, the iron core is demagnetized. Zero magnetic flux. So I have zero magnetic flux. Uh, in fact, it's not exactly the magnetized, the total magnetic field, the total magnetic flux is zero. The total, to be precise, the total magnetic flux is zero. We have um, still some magnetic flux because of the magnetic field intensity. And then I continue. Now I have magnetization in the opposite direction. I reach this point where I have now saturation on the other side. At this point now, um, I have strong alignment of the magnetic dipole moments on the other direction. Then I start reducing this current to go back. And you see at this point now, I have zeroed out my current, so at this point my current is zero, and still there is residual magnetic field on the other side now. And my magnet looks now like this. It is, in fact, having the North Pole on this side and the South Pole on this side, and the magnetic field lines are like that. Because remember, uh, these have been produced by a current that flows in the opposite direction. So now the North Pole is on the left and the South Pole is on the right. So this curve is called hysteresis curve. Uh, the most interesting quantities here are the residual magnetic flux. We also tend to keep track of this magnetic field, H sub C, that is called the coercive magnetic field.
So it shows you how fat is this curve. How fat is this curve? For example, for uh, uh, what we call hard magnets, that is magnets that are supposed to be permanent magnets, this H sub C is in the order of or above 10 to the 5 amps per meter. So we need large currents in order to uh, magnetize a medium that is supposed to act as a permanent magnet. So you see there is a difference between hysteresis curves that look like this, where the coercive field is small, and hysteresis cur curves that look like this, where the, this coercive magnetic field is larger. What is the difference between those two? If I take a material that has a hysteresis curve like that, I can demagnetize it with relatively small magnetic field. So a small magnetic field can actually demagnetize the magnet. This is the kind of thing that we experience many times with uh, credit cards, with T-cards that get demagnetized. Okay. In this case, this material is called soft ferromagnetic material. This one, you see, is a hard core material. To demagnetize it, that is, if, if you are being sold this material at this operating point, zero magnetic field intensity has this magnetic flux density, and you demagnetize it, you need to actually, you need to provide a very large current in order to demagnetize this. So this is what we call a hard ferromagnetic medium, or a hard magnet, So this uh, question uh, appeared in, a, in an exam a few years ago, and it says, two ferromagnetic materials are characterized by the following magnetization curves. These are the, another term to describe this bit wage uh, curve. Which one of the two would you choose for a permanent magnet? So the conclusion, really, the takeaway point from uh, these two curves is that this one, once you buy a magnet, the magnet operates at this point because you buy it without a coil. You have a core, that means that there is no magnetic field intensity, but there is flux. And that flux comes because of this strong alignment of the magnetic dipoles inside the magnet. So you're operating at this point. How can you destroy your magnet if from this point you go to this point? So to go from here to here, you need a current that, you see, the more to the left, or the more to the right it, it is, the greater the value of the magnetic field intensity you need to create. It can be in the millions of amps per meter, and the harder it is to demagnetize that magnet. So the thicker this curve, the more appropriate for a permanent uh, magnet, for this, uh, the hard magnet, uh, as we call it. Uh, so, Transformers uh, uh, require soft magnetic uh, materials. Uh, on the other hand, uh, magnets, tapes uh, uh, are requiring uh, magnets for sure, hard magnetic media that have those uh, thicker magnetization curves. So I think uh, I covered everything I wanted to say about magnetic materials, and I will leave you with this uh, summary of what we have seen uh, today. So, thanks for your attention and uh, we'll continue with uh, boundary conditions tomorrow. Before I close the lecture, any questions? Questions? Okay, so that's it. Thank you.